Hello humanity and welcome back to the We Are Not Lonely podcast. <laughs> I can't believe it's been about 40... This is the 40th episode of the podcast and I've only just realized that I've been doing the intro in a sort of a British accent. I need to work on this whole aspect of doing multiple voices. <laughs> I think that's a fun hobby to have. Maybe become a voice actor, I don't know. I'll never tell. Yeah, this podcast is coming out late. I've been putting my life together after the whole incident. Let's refer to that particular thing as the incident. Since you'll have about two to three podcasts worth of context, I'm not going to give you all any more. Even though I know for a fact that bitches love context, you'll have enough context. You can go find out from what... You can go find out what happened from the previous podcasts. I'm fine now. Just saying. All right. So... Today, we're going to be... <laughs> can't even... Oh, God. That's brilliant. All right, so... I've been putting my life back together after the whole thing. And a bunch of people are leaving the city. So I'm getting used to saying goodbye. It's already been happening a lot. But today has been brilliant. For those of you who are wondering, I've been doing ice parts on a regular now. It's been about... Three times, this was my third time, and I've finally reached about 11 minutes in the water. I wore my rings inside the water like a dumbass. I shouldn't have, because I could feel the cold hitting me a lot more because I was wearing the rings. I guess it's because it's a really good conductor of heat, and I don't know. I don't understand the science. I dropped science, and I picked up commas in the 8th grade. So... Honestly, I don't know what today's podcast is going to be about, man. I just thought I'd sit in front of the mic and have a good old ramble. Like the old times, I had a sort of a a plan, I guess. I sort of had a plan. I, I thought I'd sit and talk about... Right, okay. So I'm going to be talking about experiences. So recently, I've been understanding and discovering the fact that I need to talk to people more. See, the issue is I've been doing this podcast, we've hit about episode 40, which is almost 40 plus hours of podcasts, right? Like, on a on an average. Let's assume that it's, it's actually 45 to 30 minutes, so it's not quite 40 hours of a podcast. It's not quite 40 hours of a podcast, I, I get that now, my bad. Give me a second, hold up, hold up, hold up. I forgot the pop filter. I hope there's a difference now. Anyway, it's been about 40 hours, close to 40 hours of a podcast. Let's just go with that estimate. And here's what I've noticed, man. One, I do listen to the podcast on my own. I I love the sound of my own voice. All right? Uh, I'm just going to admit it. <laughs> and... I do listen to it because I do have a great deal of insight. And the only time that I can have a good conversation is when I'm speaking to myself. (laughs) Speaking of good conversation, I realized that doing this podcast thing is kind of setting me back in the conversational department. Because I can go on rants, dude. I can speak for 40 plus minutes without a break. And in conversations, this is not something that happens on the regular. Generally, there's a person speaking and then you stop, you absorb whatever they've been saying, you repeat it back to them to gain their approval and show them that you're listening. There's actually really good conversational material, by the way. If you want to learn how to talk, that bit was gold. (laughs) I know this and I'm working on becoming a better conversationalist. But the issue is, once in a week... I sit in front of a mic and I just pew venom. (laughs) The problem with this particular issue is I've got to understand that I can't go on 40 minute rants, 40 to 1 hour rants by myself in public when I'm supposed to be speaking to other people. I need to be a lot more concise. Okay, so full disclosure, I've actually done like two open mics so far. Both of them comedy based. One of them was slightly philosophy and then comedy. It kind of leaned into each other because nobody expected me to be doing the comedy after the first initial part. But like I said, it was all about the context. That initial about five minutes was me giving context 
about certain aspects of sanatan dharma particularly the pancha mahayagna which i'll talk about eventually and what happened was i i factored that into my stand up so it was kind of educational and comedic at the same time oh my god that was brilliant sorry <laughs> okay um after the ice bath i've been kind of on a high you could say i've had like two meals today one was a brilliant avocado wrap like a burrito almost i'm going on tangents again on time let's get back to what i was talking about so the reason i started this entire thing was over the past couple of months i've met quite a few new friends a lot of them from other countries they come down to my town which i've spoken about before mysore is like one of the second most well known cities for yoga the first i think would be rishikesh and i didn't know about this for a very long time i didn't know about it i didn't experience it until recently now i knew mysore was kind of a hot spot like a lot of foreigners foreign nationals firangs why people would come down and study yoga here all right but i didn't really realize the scale of what was happening at one particular time in the past we had a guest we hosted a particular guest from france who stayed in our house for a couple of months and just did yoga for a very long time and even then it didn't really click in my head that this was a thing so it took me some time to understand this entire situation and i really understood what was happening here after i experienced the yoga culture by immersing myself in it just give me a second she wouldn't call unless it was important i have returned triumphant <laughs> all right so i was saying i've met a lot of people i've met and meet a lot of friends acquaintances whatever you'd like to call it if you want to be technical about it you can be technical about it it's completely fine so a bunch of people were leaving and i thought i'd give them a goodbye present so i just went over and i gave them a bunch of rudraksha as memories of india <laughs> and the reason i realized that this entire thing was happening was because i had to be extremely conscious during the entire conversation regarding yeah don't go crazy don't overdo the conversation give them time to talk absorb information i had to do that consciously and i realized oh wait i might have a problem maybe this whole podcasting thing is getting things out of hand <laughs> i mean it's not really an issue i do know how to converse but that just makes me think and it strongly advocates for the case that i need guests on the podcast and i need to figure out how to do that like on a technological level i do have like a like an audio interface i do have an audio interface where i can have up to 8 inputs which is really cool it's actually supposed to be a drum or it's an audio interface for plugging an entire drum kit in and it's supposed to go on a rack and i've sort of put it on a rack but not iraq on iraq right my point being is that i need to figure out how to do this entire thing i have borrowed a friend's mic and in true scummy behavior i'm going to give the shitty of mic to my friends because you know i'm an asshole <laughs> right so that's about it for that particular train of thought I've just realized that while podcasting has had amazing benefits for me personally I've gotten a lot more articulate I've stopped using as much filler words I've gotten very articulate actually I've gotten better at presenting my it's all the same thing isn't it those are different ways those are different ways of saying the same thing which is oh i've gotten better at communication basically that's the point i've been trying to communicate 
my speech has become a lot more fluent again same thing <laughs> but like there are parts of good communication fluent speech clear words spoken which is part of fluent speech but also grasp over knowledge and ability to communicate ideas seamlessly lack of filler words you can put this in a powerpoint presentation theoretically so that's the situation man i'm trying to understand how these people who do yoga and form such bonds just get used to this it's intense i'll be straight up with you dude like for the past 7 and a half years i've been a shot in more or less i do my own thing especially over the past couple of years with the whole pandemic i've become a shot in i do my own work i do a lot of content creation i, I I haven't really been putting out content as much as I've been creating but I've been creating a lot of new things I've been doing a lot of work and I guess that was the logical next step to just put out content and I enjoy doing it now which is why I'm doing this entire situ this is why I'm doing the entire thing if I didn't really like sitting in front of the mic listening to my voice for about 45 minutes and then listening to it again while I'm editing <laughs> I wouldn't really be doing this would I hitting 42 episodes makes me wonder how long is this going to keep going i want this to go on for a while i have very ambitious plans not in terms of like money just like with the podcast particularly i just want ha- i want to have interesting conversations i'm going to put out an intention to the universe go for it I've just realized that I have a very interesting network and I haven't really explored just how wide and far reaching it is and the interesting kind of people that I've been coming across recently but fact of the matter is I know some interesting people who have who are going to have some interesting stories like for example any conversation with a person from my school is going to be killer the kind of stories it's going to leave a lot of people traumatized people are going to be like they went through that and the further we go back into the history like my batch was probably one of the last batches to get caned like whipped with a stick this used to happen in my school back in the day even though corporal punishment was banned according to the diary that the school itself would give us where our principal would talk about it corporal punishment was banned but i remember getting caned all the way up to 8th and 9th standard i'm just putting that information out there just so you know it's very funny uh, my batch was probably the last to be caned at that level and after that just a bunch of things happened people got soft i guess i don't know it's difficult i wouldn't wish anybody undue suffering but over the past couple of months i've started to realize that for men especially suffering is what builds character and i know that this is going to sound like one of those platitudes as one of my old friends as one of my old almost more than friends would have called it i know i'm a platitude generating bot sometimes right but there is truth to the saying there are they are platitudes for a reason there is a great deal of truth in them and people have recognized it which is why it keeps coming up time and again Now the issue that I've noticed is that strong men are created by hard times. They go through suffering and just like iron goes stronger after being in hell fire. And experiencing blow after blow of the hammer 
iron gets hardened after all of that it reaches its ultimate form the sword this is a metaphor <laughs> just like that a man gets stronger and more capable more competent more dangerous by suffering and i've seen life become easier in a good way over the years but the issue is that if there are no hard times if there's no and dr peterson has spoken about this if the, if society was perfect we would just mess things up and i think it's also echoed in the matrix everything was perfect and people just started messing things up we like chaos we like the unknown too much of order is not a good thing either so bad times hard times create strong men suffering is important to become strong to become a good strong man another problem <laughs> it's the cycle strong men create good times good times create weak men weak men create hard times and hard times create good men and the circle the cycle perpetuates ad infinitum this is some this is an idea that is shared by a great deal of people including andrew tate now i understand that people don't really like andrew tate and yeah sure everybody's entitled to their opinion but i haven't met somebody with a clear reason they quote his old work like here's the thing about andrew tate man say what you will he's been released from prison recently he's been released from an unlawful detainment there was no reason to keep him in jail for that long but they did it anyway and the amount of people that had rejoiced over that particular thing was insane they're like we don't like what he's saying so we're going to shut him up he can't say things that we don't agree with and that's a dangerous precedent a lot of people have warned against that now i might not accept what you're saying but i respect your right to say it that's the kind of an attitude we've got to have moving forward right but there are certain groups in society that have started to terrorize that have started to push weight unduly on certain issues only what they say is right only they have this monopoly to violence now in a civilized society <laughs> i like that little joke in a society in a civilized society the idea is that the government is the only person the only entity that has the monopoly to violence it wasn't so earlier nobles had like if you were higher up in the hierarchy especially in the feudal age anybody with a decent amount of power could do a great deal of violence for example there was one particular company with a great deal of wealth they were called the east india company they came to india to trade and thanks to the mogal emperor who was a weakling and a fool he gave them the right to bear arms and amass private armies for a very cheap price i think it was like for beer or something and he was muslim which is weird because they're not supposed to drink it's haram so he basically allowed them to come here and that set the tone for the english conquest of india the east india company was brutal they were so brutal that they had taken over an entire country most of the country there were great deal of pockets of resistance in and around even among the people that quote and quote worked for the so called eic one of them being the sepoy revolt in 1857 now this is something i've been studying up i've been brushing up up brushing up on history because i'm reading a particular book and there will be more of this topic coming all right i don't understand why i went on this particular tangent but i'm just going to continue it because this is going to be one hell of a podcast <laughs> so the east india company had this entire country by the balls the country was india my country 
and eventually their atrocities got so severe that Queen Victoria had to step in and assume ownership. So essentially, they became India became a colony of Britain of Great Britain. and it continued to be a colony until 1947 when lord mountbatten had enough of being a colony and he left the country <laughs> sorry lord mountbatten had enough and great uh, britain had lost a lot of wealth after fighting in world war 2 on multiple fronts even though they were victorious they had spent a great deal and they couldn't afford to keep all of these colonies running especially the crown jewel which was india they had siphoned off a great deal of wealth and this is an interesting point right because world war 1 and world war 2 at this particular point in time great britain had been bleeding india dry financially every single scrap of everything that was produced in india was done for britain's benefit even the railways which is a great argument for all of these colonizers right they're like oh great britain didn't do anything bad they gave india the railways and uh, and i've heard a lot of indians make this argument as well and my point my counter argument to that was it wasn't made for our benefit for a very long time indians weren't even allowed on these trains first class was not for indians we had a particular class that we were allowed to travel in Okay, most of it was generally cattle class. Indians could travel on cattle class. Even in the UK Parliament, right? It was mentioned no Indians and dogs allowed into the House of Commons, as I understand it's called. And that's why Rishi Sunak walked in with a dog on a leash into the House of Commons when he became the Prime Minister, which was really cool, I guess. <laughs> that was trippy, dude. Anyway, my point. Anyway, my point is that. Great Britain, UK, whatever you want to call it, London, the the royal family of England had basically bled India dry over the course of two hundred years. All of the wealth was sucked out of India to the tune of trillions of dollars in today's currency, and this has been measured. And how is it measured? Well, at the point where Great Britain took over India, there was India held. like the entire subcontinent which is more or less there's a great deal of fragmentation over here no doubt but the point being that what is now known as india at that particular point of time had 45% of the world's gdp and by the time the Brit- by the time britain left i think it dropped to less than 3% they destroyed all of the industries there was this one particular cloth called muslin cloth which was destroyed they broke the fingers of the weavers who could weave cloth so thin that was so light and see through they destroyed all of this for the cotton industries that were developed in manchester and liverpool manchester i think of manchester if i remember correctly this was the legacy of great britain in india and when they left us we were a beggared nation we had nothing left and we've crawled our way up to one of the fastest developing economies now and we've weathered so many storms no doubt there's a great deal of nationalist pride in this particular statement and i agree yeah sure i'm proud to be indian <laughs> no doubt my point being i had a point to all of this I had a point to this very long winded rant what was it Let's read your steps. Goodbyes, conversations, debate, talking about what's going wrong in life. Yeah, monopoly to violence. So at that particular point in time, a bunch of companies had the ability to incite violence at any particular point of time, and as we quote unquote became civilized and became democratic, quote unquote. <laughs> we decided to hand over that right to violence we collectively gave it away to the government now in theory only the government has the monopoly to violence but unfortunately even in india is this one particular group that has decided to say like no we also have the right to be violent at times 
this is how we protest like we set things on fire and we destroy public property and private property because we don't like something that somebody said and because a certain person has drawn a cartoon a lot of allegations here <laughs> it should be clear what i'm talking about and i'm setting the tone for the next coming podcasts where i'm going to be talking about why religion has become a very important topic in india why it's so linked to identity cultural national whatever and i'm trying to understand this myself all right at a particular point of time i i hated the word religious i never like to call myself to admit that i was a religious individual but now i'm just going to be like yeah if that's what you'd like to call me go ahead i'm a proud hindu i will not be ashamed of the practices that i practice i'm not ashamed of my identity yes i am hindu and the reason that this particular thing is coming about is because certain elections are coming and in india unfortunately religion has become tied to politics and of course everything happens for a reason and i'm going to be exploring the reason why this has happened and that's going to be me going into the past nearly 200 years into the past and talking about why this particular situation in the present has come about as a result of certain movements that have been happening over the course of 700 800 years onwards it's very controversial even today anything that talks about a, a hindu identity a cultural identity that transcends the idea of a nation is laughed at by certain people and that's why it's become a political issue i know friends who proudly say yeah i'm atheistic and and it's completely fine but you have to understand that there are very few religions that give you the right to be atheistic now i was having a conversation with a friend today and i didn't really go into the full topic because one was because i had just had food and i didn't want to get into that entire discussion at that particular moment i was relaxing and i had just come to say bye and it was a religion it was a context it was a discussion about religion all right and it was this idea that oh organized religion is uh, not that great and even like the hindu religion doesn't really understand and there are gods up there and there are things down here and whereas certain animistic shamanistic religions are all about the beings that are here and i've been thinking about that particular idea and i'm going to be st- starting my studies into that particular topic i heard something called panchamama i believe and i want to explore all of this but i've done a great deal of study into sanatan dharma and one of the beautiful things about sanatan dharma is that it's all encompassing there's this one particular shloka that talks about ekam sat bahuta viprita vadanti like the truth is one but we know it by different names and this particular thing has been misused by a lot of people we've seen the fact that indians are so happy to accept other religions i've seen places where a picture of jesus is placed on the same altar as a picture of shiva and both like they have the garlands they put tikka they put uh, namam to jesus as well and they offer incense and all of that and that's the beauty of sanatan dharma we like we have no problem bro here oh yeah we don't worry bro you want to oh this is your god don't worry we'll also pray to him we are completely fine with that but certain people are like no and i'll be exploring that in the future i'm going to be going deeply into that and i've been thinking now i didn't want to get into the whole topic but i've been thinking about it i didn't want to get into the topic at that particular time but uh, since i didn't do that much study into the thing but i've been thinking about the whole animistic concept and all and how to the idea of veda like sanatan dharma is that the gods walked earth one of the ways that my friend described Uth- uttarakhand context uttarakhand is in the north of india it's close to the mountains it's a place 
that my friend from the north described as devabhumi and the reason that it's called devabhumi is that gods have walked walked in that land and the way he described it is that the vibration there is something else it's beautiful it's another level and now india itself is a land where gods walk on earth there's this particular tradition that pays a great deal of homage to earth spirits and daivas they call it like for example i don't know if you've watched the movie kantara but panjurli is shown in the form of a boar a wild boar and he's associated with nature and forests now guligin is a fierce form he's some call him the son of shani this mandiputra and he's a fierce being who accepts a great deal of sacrifice he's found in forests he's the protector of forests now both of these are minutely connected with the forest with the earth and the same tradition is found everywhere along the coastal regions of karnataka all the way to coop this even in kerala you find guligin now daivas differ from area to area there are different daivas in i'm i'm not sure i think mutappan is a proper form of shiva but he the some of the traditions attributed to the daiva kola also a performed for mutappan there's a dance there's a dance where there's a dance where it's believed that shiva in his form as mutappan descends and you offer liquor to mutappan he likes liquor he likes to hunt and all of that it's a very complex topic that can't really be summarized like the rest that's all i'm going to say the kind of things that are found in hinduism are so vast that even to i've been studying this ever since 2012 and i i don't have all the answers it's been almost 12 years traditionally 12 years is the period that you go stay with a guru and you study and you get the entire knowledge but i haven't been doing that i've been living in the material world as well that's the point i've been trying ow oh, that's the point i've been trying to make right if i had studied just under a guru for the past 12 years i'd have understood what sanatan dharma was but i don't have a full understanding i'm still seeking i'm still learning I'm still trying to understand it like i've said many times before this is the kali yuga this is a dark age this is the age of ignorance where people have lost their way they, they've forgotten who they really are what their purpose is and so on and so forth the only thing that exists is a rampant greed for the physical for the material and i understand this this is how the world is it's completely it's sad but that's how it is now the point i've been trying to make is i want to have more conversations more interesting conversations i'd like to have to be it's if possible on topics i'd like to come away learning about something now i i learned something important today there's this idea that gods live up in the sky that is prevailed among the west and generally is people assume that yeah that's the same thing here but that's not really the case yes we do have certain pantheons like we have the devas who are kind of like the greek gods right they live up in the heavens they live in swarga and in swarga they enjoy the party they have a cool time they perform sacrifices they have was every once in a while now the interesting thing is that we also have gods who stay here we have rishis who stay on earth who are still doing tapas in the himalayas who people haven't really found and it's difficult to separate the spirituality aspect from hinduism it's very difficult the amount of practices that one can follow you can pick and choose it's almost like a buffet you can choose what you want you can choose to be atheistic no other organized religion will give you this much of freedom what god do you want to worship how would you like to worship 
if you want to worship that way then there are certain rules or you don't want to do that you just you just want to do your own thing go ahead or you don't want to do anything at all you want to be an atheist you don't want to profess okay go ahead do that or you want to believe in pure logic go ahead bro or you want to reach god through your study of grammar yeah that's the thing you want to reach god through your study of sanskrit grammar go right ahead bro knock yourself out vyakarana masti ta kuru karo to karo to but if you choose a path to certain rules again if you decide to oh i'm i'm going to blaze my own trail you can choose to do it by yourself if you'd like to but it might take you some time to before you get any leeway in that particular direction but that's also fine the idea is that they've given you so many paths you can pick and choose oh i'd like to progress and you can try them out and i've spoken about all of this in the past podcast there are different ways you can use to accelerate your consciousness uh, to elevate your consciousness and that's why a lot of people are attracted to yoga now the truth is yoga is a spiritual practice no doubt but it was given by shiva and shiva is worshiped primarily by hindus yoga is hindu it can be practiced by others but you have to understand that it comes from this particular source that's the thing so i think i will end this particular podcast on that note man i did not expect for this to happen we've crossed a lot of boundaries <laughs> But let me just say this I now have an understanding of what the next few episodes are going to be like I do understand where I want to take this podcast and it's going to be a fun journey I have a bunch of things to do I have a lot to read and I'm working on a video I need a comeback video soon I'll do it I'll see you guys soon thank you so much punar milama ha sukino bhavantu dhanyawad ha punar milama